I asked an elder um, what about climate change and um, what we've done. She told me climate change is a cycle and it's really nothing we can do to stop a cycle of change. And how big do we think we are <laughs> that we think we're, we're causing the change? But there are some things that we have done and there are things that we can do to um, probably slow down part of it. First time I didn't believe in my, our ways. You know, I used to make fun of it. Huh? And then I started talking to the elders, not from here, but from other, other reserves when I go to powwows. And they start, I start talking to them what our old, old ways are. Huh? To me, and, and to a lot of Native people, it goes in, in cycles. Um, just like the change of from spring to summer to fall to winter, you know, we're still living in the same environment, but it's changing. Um, and these are cycles. The climate change, it, it's, it's going to happen regardless. Um, because it's, it, it is a change, and, and when you're talking about change, change does happen. The evidence is that climate change is happening, whether it's man-made or whether it's uh, just a natural cycle, and the theme of this particular project is adaptation, in which we simply say to ourselves, it's happening, and we have to adapt to it and get ready for it, because whether we like it or not, or whether we can slow it down or not, it's still happening, and we have to adapt to it. During the last six months, uh, together with Nancy McDonald, I've been working on this, um, gathering information and uh, putting together a report on what uh, climate change means for this specific community, as well as it can be figured out, and um, uh, to suggest the things that should be done uh, which would let this, this First Nation adapt uh, as the years go by to the effects that are expected to come from climate change. Temperatures are generally rising, and there's no question about that. It appears that the temperature rises in the winter are going to be greater than they will be in the summertime. So the winters are going to become warmer. Uh, they're going to become more warm than the summers are going to become warmer. Um, and that's going to mean quite a bit. Since this is happening, whether we like it or not, and all of those mitigation measures are only going to slow down the rate of change. They're not going to reverse it. Uh, nobody's even talking about reversing these changes. Uh, it's going to keep happening, so let's get ready. We depend on fire, really, right now. We depend on electricity and fire. It's a little ironic to me, um, you know, we need that fire to give us electricity. Um, and that's all we needed before. We didn't have electricity. <laughs> we didn't have all, any of these conveniences that we use now. Um, but it was the fire that sustained our people. Like it protected us from from any wildlife that would be out there. Um, it protected us um, to feed us, to cook our foods, to make our medicines, um, to warm us up. As a traditional and taking the teachings from our elders. Um, even in the creation story, cre Creator gave us fire from a um, lightning bolt. And from that, um, man was created. From their stories, we know that our people have used fire to sustain them for forever, you know, since they were Mi'kmaq. The fire was based on uh, life, energy, culture. We need the fire from the sun to to have the to have plants 
grow and trees to live and for the for the life to uh, to exist in the earth. Bukto, that's fire. In in our in our language, in our tradition ways, fire could heal you. Like when they have a sacred fire, uh, the sac the sacred fire could heal you. Huh? The rocks are heated from the fire from the sacred fire outside that is connected to the spirit fire of Creator. Where we put the rocks inside the sweat lodge, there's a pit there. It's it's a, an area that that's dug. It connects to the fire in the center of the earth. Well, actually, when you really do think about it, we do use too much uh, carbon and we do use too much uh, fire. What we need to do is to to balance it, is to is to uh, reduce uh, reduce using the fire, reduce uh, using the carbon. In other words, what should we all be doing as a society to re to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide? We should be becoming more energy efficient. We should be um, making less use of fossil fuels in every way we can, uh, and uh, themes like that. Electricity will, may come from windmills or, or uh, solar, solar heat, solar panels. Put windmills up in the mountains that would generate, that would run the whole reserve. Uh, you could get energy from uh, water. Middle River, that river there that you could put two turbines and you could get electricity from there. It might take a while. The, the earth alone itself will uh, heal. But if we keep going the way we're going right now, it's just going to have a harder time for that earth to heal itself. I use are um, Wamigo. It's ground. Sitramu, that's the world. Um, Dupkwan would be the soil that you pick up. The earth gave us uh, soil to plant uh, food and also it gave us flowers to uh, get medicine. We make our own medicine. Uh, I'll be going to the woods and gathering up what I need. I just take what I need, that's all. You know, I don't go overboard and take the whole bunch home. Just enough for me and my wife or if somebody's sick. If I was a 10-year-old, if a 10-year-old would be nice to go up to an elder and ask them to, can you take me up to this uh, tree they're talking about, and, uh, and I would like to uh, experience it myself. As the temperatures go up, uh, the evaporation of water is going to be much more extreme. We're going to lose more water to the atmosphere because it is going to be warmer. And because our dry periods are going to be drier, and when rainfall comes, it's going to come more quickly and more intensely, and therefore run off more quickly, uh, the levels of moisture in the soil are going to go down. The soils are going to become drier, and this will have an effect on insect life, animal life, uh, uh, and also plant life. I'm sure if we go back <clears throat> and teach uh, the young ones today to how to plant and, and, uh, and grow potatoes or even to grow a cornfield or, or anything that uh, um, related to uh, gardening. gardening Keeps, keeps you busy, and it's really um, a hard work, but at, at the end, it's really uh, rewarding, uh, rewarding. And when, when you go out there, when, when you find that this um, but, um, potato that I just plant there, and it's growing, and, and it's when you go at the end there, and you pluck it, and, and you see it, and, and it's feels so good and that's how that's how I felt my daughter feels so good when she does something like that and she's so happy just like uh, when you uh, you know how when you're young and when you're playing in the sand when in the sand you're building a sand castle or and it's just like 
you get that exciting feeling when you play, play with their, uh, dirt. And but you're not only you're playing with dirt, but you're also um, giving life. There's a lot of things that people um, try to tell us, like, um, well, that's not Mi'kmaq, that's not Native, um, that's not how it was, or that's not how it is. And that's using old, to me, that's using old thought. Like I say, we're, we're changing, <laughs> we're, we're constantly changing. Um, sometimes there's reasons why um, um, different plants leave an area and the new plants come out. We have to use what we have. There's a lot of um, plants here that uh, we know are not native. One is burdock. It grows, it grows everywhere. Recently I learned that um, burdock and one of our medicines, um, bagosi, um, have the same um, medicines in the root. Um, I know that um, a lot of um, people pick um, Bagosi um, as an all-purpose medicine, and and you have to go to the marshes to get it. But if we had to get um, burdock, it's just on on our yards. You know, <laughs> mine grows under my step. That's the same thing as um, dandelion. <laughs> dandelion is. Well, as far as I know, is a native here, but it grows everywhere, and we're just tossing it out and without even taking a second look at it. And it has a lot of healing um, properties. You pick the top soft dandelion, and you pick the yellow part of the dandelion. You let it dry for maybe a day until all the moisture leaves it. You find a jar and uh, you fill it up with the dandelion, just stuff the yellow um, petals in the, in the jar, and then you pour um, olive oil until it reaches the top and close it for six weeks. After six weeks, um, you can use it as an oil or you can go a little further and use beeswax and make a salve with it. You know, there's different books out there that you can um, even um, get um, recipes of different herbs that grow. Air is a uh it's like a spirit, really, air, to me. You know, it keeps you alive. Juicing, juicing is one word. That's, that's the wind, juicing. And the general rule of thumb seems to be, from what we can understand, that the extreme weather events, whether it's uh, the dryness of the dry periods or uh, the extremity or the, uh, the rate of rainfall, um, uh, the highest wind speeds, all of these things are going to become more extreme. So if we've been accustomed to having the very highest winds being, for example, uh, typically 90 kilometers an hour, the scientists tell us that these wind speeds are going to go up by around 10 percent, uh, the peak wind speeds. So rather than 90 kilometer an hour winds uh, that we'd see here uh, uh, historically as being really extreme, we're going to start to see 100 kilometer an hour winds when we get the high winds. And this means a lot in terms of um, the effect on structures and vegetation and so on. Uh, a wind would bring anything. Like I said, with wind, um, there's a lot of um, air that's coming from somewhere else that, that wasn't ours, and, and it's, it comes through our communities because there's times when after a strong wind that you go out there and you smell the air, um, you can smell um, forest fires from from away, but as you get closer to my house, it's it starts to um, I can start feeling the clean air that's in that area because 
the trees are filtering a lot of the air that flows through that area. And to tell you the truth, when I was 10 years old, I was uh, cutting trees down. And, and I didn't have a, I didn't think that way. I didn't think about, uh, um, when I was cutting this tree down, I didn't think about uh, this tree's uh, giving us uh, air. The increased wind speeds that I mentioned earlier are also going to now be kicking up uh, even higher and more aggressive waves. Uh, luckily for this community, and you're very lucky in this regard, your shorelines um, along the lake are practically all quite steep and rocky. So as you get that much more aggressive wave action and wind action on the shore, you're not going to see as much damage and as much erosion and uh, distress caused here as would be the case if you had a really low-lying flat community where uh, the effect of rising water level and more aggressive wave action and so on it can be really quite profound. Uh, so count yourselves lucky because you really are in that regard. We just live in an area that's so protected because, you know, we don't, we're not anywhere near an ocean right where we are here in Wamukuk. Um, and one of the reasons why our people built here is because of the protection of this valley that uh, we don't get the um, winds from the oceans. But we do get winds. When we get um, wind that comes from the south, that's usually when I go to town and fill up on um, candles and extra water and, you know, extra food because they've always told us when we were even growing up, when we get the south winds and you feel the warm breeze coming right to my house's face south. I don't know why I did that, but um, when the wind comes toward me, that's when I say I have to pay attention. In our community, in our tradition ways, air could heal you too. If there was um, so much pollution out there that we weren't able to breathe this air, there's a place we can go to breathe clean air and that would be inside a sweat lodge. It's pure air there. It's, it's made by the water and the fire, the rocks in the womb of Mother Earth. It's all in there, in, in, in this sweat lodge, and that would be the safest place to be. Water is, it is a very important uh, element, if you ask me. On our reserve, we have tree, tree streams, we have one big stream over here in the Middle River. Then we have one up, up the road. It's called uh, Hewns River. There's two Hewns, Hewns Rivers. Huh? We call one that Lake Jibujis. That It's called Hewns River, though. And then the other one is uh, way a little bit further up. And that's called uh, Hewns River. There's uh, different words for different places of water, um, a bot. Um, what would that be? That would be the water out there on the lakes. Um, Cebu would be the water on the river. Um, uh, Cebujis would be um, the little brooks. Gubog would be the spring water coming from, you know, the from the ground. That cool water I was talking about. That the one I keep mentioning that has a distinct smell. Mm -hmm. And when you're walking by it, you know it's there. It's it's see, it's a different kind of air. You you feel that breeze. You smell it. And even if you look around that area, you hear more um, um, 
wildlife activity more birds um, you'll see little um, squirrels or whatever you know it's it's livelier there um, even the leaves when you're driving by somewhere and you know that the, you don't know if there's a spring there you'll see you'll see trees sort of the leaves moving like um, rustling even if there's no wind in in the air you just it's just a different feeling there you'll get to an area where there's an opening in the ground and it's just like um, it's like a big um, deep bucket on the ground that's why I, I think it's a little dangerous too to just to run through that moss area when you get in those areas because you don't know where that um, good book is. Well, um, there's areas that, well, once you find a stream that, uh, and, uh, and it's uh, spring water, that most, of, most of the water that you, you see coming down that stream is coming from the well. And once you get to that well, it's, it's nice cold, even in the uh, middle of summer. There was a lot of uh, moss growing along, um, aside, um, beside it. And it was uh, more like um, a bog. You find them anywhere. Um, they, they come from the ones that I'm thinking about in my mind. Um, it, they all come from the mountains, you know. Um, the ones up here, um, I know the water vein that, that flows right through there, flows right through my house. Um, and it ends up down below at the beach. But along there, Along that area, you're going to see a lot of water holes. We can also like uh, uh, store it, just like uh, just like what they have here, that uh, huge huge uh, tank, and there's the storage tank for the water for the reserve in Wamatko, and that's all coming from uh, the spring water up in the mountains. If I had a choice to drink drink the water that I drink, it would be water from our community, because I know where it comes from. You know, I, I know it comes from the mountain. I know it comes from, from the water tower, and, and somebody's there all the time checking that water, and you should start asking their parents where, where that, um, the water is because I'm sure they still remember, as, as I remember, um, where those water holes are. I remember... Um, quite a few of them now that there's houses built on them or different structures built there. There's two two or three places that you could drill water, get water from. Huh? There's one and there's one up in uh, where the band office is and there's another one up near Kazawek, uh, we call it Kazawek at the point. Young, young people wouldn't know about these. Huh? To learn about it I think you could just Study it, or tell the elders. Get a go to Bidek or go to the band office, and they'll get a a map, a map of the area. Say if our water tower shut down, and our pumps weren't running, or or they were doing some maintenance on it, we'd have to know where our other waters are. Waters that um, we know are clean. And the waters that I know are clean come from our mountains here because I know what's up there and it's just, you know, just nature. In our culture, it is a medicine. It's one of the stronger medicines that we have. If we don't have water, we don't exist. We do need to know what, what this is. Um, uh, what this particular community can do. Um, first of all, when we talk about um, the topic, one thing has become very clear, and that is that there's a really great need to monitor on a regular basis how these effects are taking place in a particular place. Well, the climate right here in Wabatook is not exactly the same as it is at the Sydney airport. You have a different uh, system of rainfall and wind speeds and snowfalls and all the rest of it. So in order to really keep track of what's happening right here, 
setting up some kind of community-based monitoring um, of uh, things like uh, rainfall and uh, lake level um, uh, precipitation and uh, uh, wind speeds and so on, so on is very important. All the things that have been built by mankind here in the community, like, like roads and buildings and wharves and all the rest, as I say, luckily for this community, you're not very vulnerable. Uh, probably the most vulnerable structure you have is the wharf because it's right there at water level. It's exposed to wave action and all the rest, but it, but it appears to be a good modern wharf and it's been well built and, you know, it's not one that's really vulnerable right now. But these things should be kept an eye on as time goes by. You have a community plan. Uh, I've, I've reviewed that as part of this project. And there are some important uh, topics in that plan to do with um, uh, the community awareness and uh, the theme of self-sufficiency and uh, uh, self-governance that are very important. And the things to do with climate change and that look to the future should be incorporated during a review of that community plan. You know, you build a little model village and, and you start taking, digging out little pieces and, and then you bring your wind through it, you know, because a lot of our areas here have been clear cut for, for, um, for progress. We never think about replanting many of these areas, and we have to start thinking that way um, because there, these plants aren't just going to come and grow back on their own. Trees are female, and um, that's why w at ceremonies uh, we wear our skirts so Creator recognizes women as women and, and the same as the tree. So the trees do, um, you know, play a big part in our lives. It's, they're the grandmothers, they're the ones that we, we start our, our fires with. The rocks we consider our grandfathers and the earth our mother. You must have heard people saying, uh, the grandmothers and the grandfather bring the grandmothers in, bring the grandfathers in. It's our trees and it's our, our rocks that we talk about. They're all connected, you know, <laughs> somewhere they're all connected. <laughs> and, and when you talk about water, you're going to end up talking about the wind and the wind with the air and, I mean, with, with the fire. They're, they all, <laughs> they're all connected. Take your child to see an elder. If you see an elder, they'll explain more huh, on traditional ways. Talk to your grandparents about the culture, about your culture, about our culture. Uh, experience it. But if you want to learn something, you go look for it. You go look for it. Ask questions, and you'll get your answers.